Hello everyone, it's Steve with Aptera Owners Club. I recently learned something interesting and I thought I'd share it with you guys. There is a country in the world that produces 98% of its power from renewable sources. So almost 100% renewable energy um, grid. And if you were to look at the map of the world, I think that most people would think it is some uh, European country that is doing this maybe a small country like Denmark or uh, something with a small population like Finland, one of these Nordic states. Um, that's what I would have thought. But in reality, the country that has the greenest electrical grid in the entire world is the country of Uruguay. So Uruguay is a very small country sandwiched between two of the largest uh, countries in South America, Argentina and Brazil. So it, here it is. It's, a, it's only got a population of uh, 3.5 million and about half of the population lives in the capital city of Montevideo. And they transitioned to a grid that is mostly hydropower, wind power, some solar and biomass. Uh, and it in averaged out over the last several years, more than 98% of their energy has come from renew renewable sources. And they didn't necessarily do it for climate change reasons or environmental reasons. They did it for economic reasons and for um, political sovereignty reasons. And it's a pretty interesting story. So um, I'm going to so I like looked into it when I heard about it. The way I heard about it is there's this article from New York Times Magazine that says what the sustainable living look like, maybe like Uruguay. Um, if you're interested, this is a great article. I would recommend reading it. Um, basically, the article talks about how as countries become wealthier and standard of living goes up, then energy usage and um, carbon footprint of every uh, per capita goes up and America is one of the higher per capita um, carbon footprint and energy utilization countries. It far outstrips other even developed countries, mainly because we are a large country. We like large cars. We like big houses and we like to have a lot of stuff. Um, and so that drives something. And any policies that tell people to reduce their standard of living generally is not well received. And so there's an interesting quote by some economists in here that says the, the goal is to get to a pre-industrial level of resource utilization without going to a pre-industrial level standard of living. And that is kind of the balance that we're trying to look for. And in, and in many ways, Uruguay seems to have met that. And a lot of interesting things about Uruguay that I did not know. So this is the World Bank um, website talking about Uruguay. And it says Uruguay stands out in Latin America for, for being an egalitarian society for its high per capita income, low levels of inequality and poverty, and almost complete absence of extreme poverty. In relative terms, its middle class is the largest in America. So it's got a larger middle class than even the United States um, and represents more than 60% of its population. Um, sound macroeconomic management and favorable external conditions supported an economic expansion that has lasted for two decades except for the COVID-19 pandemic that induced recession in 2020. That was pretty much universal for everyone. The country experienced robust economic growth coming in out of the pandemic and thanks to prudent fiscal management currently enjoys the lowest sovereign spreads in the region. All right, so they're doing, they're doing quite well. And if you look at the Wikipedia article, um, they're talking about how Uruguay is ranked first in the Americas for dem democracy. So in terms of um, their political levels of pro political corruption and their political process, they're more democratic than the United States even, or Canada, which uh, is surprising for a Latin American country, which generally has lots of problems with their governance. Uh, the first in Latin America in peace and low perception of corruption and e-government is the lowest ranking South American nation in the Global Terrorism Index and ranks second on the continent in economic freedom, income equality, and per capita income and inflows of FDI. Uruguay is the third best country in the continent in terms of human development index, GDP growth, innovation, infrastructure. All right, so didn't, you know, Uruguay is one of these countries that most of us, at least me, I didn't think about very much, didn't know very much about it at all. If we think of South American countries, we know we think of the big countries, obviously, Argentina, Brazil, and, um, you know, and then some countries that we've heard of because, you know, they were involved in the drug wars like Colombia, you know, back in the 80s, 
and 90s was um was in the news a lot because of drugs but you know uruguay is one of these countries that we almost never hear about i guess the country that's even less heard about is paraguay which is this landlocked country nearby but i did not realize that uruguay was such a well-developed country with a high standard of living and um low disparity in um uh in, in income distribution and so uh, I learned a little bit briefly about the history. What happened was Uruguay is uh, mainly an agricultural um, country. There, there's like a five to one ratio of cows to people uh, in the country. And they had some of the highest standard of living in South America starting around World War II into the Korean War because they basically exported a lot of leather and food and agricultural goods to support the war efforts. Um, and so they they did quite well. When the wars ended, their um, market kind of died down. And then there was some economic pain that led to the um, led to some eruption of kind of leftless guerrilla um, organizations. And there was some pretty brutal suppression of these uh, these guerrillas, left wing guerrilla activity in the 60s and 70s. And then there was a military coup and there was basically a military dictatorship and they jailed a lot of these um, these mar these socialist and Marxist guerrillas and um, killed and tortured many of them. Uh, it, and then finally, they relinquished power. There was, you know, there was a public uprising against the dictatorship, and they've become a democracy since about the mid '80s. Then what happened was they were getting most of their power through um, imported oil. So they would import oil, and they had oil burning um, power plants. They had a lot of hydropower. But they basically had already dammed up all the major rivers in the country that could be used for hydropower. So there was no more hydropower available. And they actually built a pipeline from Argentina to them to try to get natural gas from Argentina to them. They have no natural resources. They have no coal, oil or natural gas reserves inside their country. So they would, it would all have to be imported. Um, so then what happened was, is about in the mid 2000s, mid to late 2000s, they started running out of energy. There was not enough energy. They had blackouts. Energy costs were extremely high and they were beholden to the commodity prices of oil to that that drove their electrical grid and it was a really bad situation there was a gentleman who was a particle physicist named i'm going to butcher his name probably but ramon mendez galain and he was a professor he he actually was a cosmologist and particle physicist he studied like the first few seconds after the big bang but he was very interested in this energy problem and he kind of looked into it and he made a proposal that there was a lot of wind energy in Uruguay and that he thought that they could become um, energy independent by, by harvesting their wind resources. And then the president um, at that time was uh, this gentleman. His name is Jose Mujica. And interestingly, he was one of these Marxist guerrillas in the 60s and 70s, and he was jailed and tortured uh, for 15 years he actually spent two years in solitary confinement at the bottom of a well and um, he's often known as the poorest um, world leader he gives away i mean he's he's he was he was a prisoner for most a lot of his adult life and so he never had any wealth and then when he became president he gave away 90 percent of his salary to um to low-income housing projects and then he stayed at his home. This is his modest home. He rides a bike or he drives this 1987 VW Beetle, which is his only vehicle. And um, he made the presidential house. He asked them to use that to house homeless people while he was president. So a very unique guy. And one of the things that he spoke out against was this Western ideal of materialism and buying more things 
to to um, um, as a way of saying that that is a more developed country and a better life. And he kind of he kind of pushed back against that and said that we should strive for a simple life that gives us freedom and time to enjoy our family and our and our hobbies and not be beholden to some economic engine where we need to like buy bigger houses, buy bigger things and just spend more money and spend more resources. Um, as uh, one of the poorest people, he says, he's, his uh, saying was, my definition of poverty is the one we owe to Seneca. Seneca obviously is the Greek Stoic philosopher. It is not the man that has too little, um, but the man who craves more, who is poor. So anyways, this guy tapped uh, this guy to help lead the uh, transition. And they looked into um, transitioning the country to wind energy. And the problem was that the startup costs for wind energy were extremely high. Their, their GDP of Uruguay, it's a very small country, is only $50 billion. And they needed like $6 billion uh, to, to set up these wind farms. And they don't have $6 billion. That's 12% of their GDP. Just imagine America spending 12% of its GDP uh, on an energy project. That would be like trillions and trillions of dollars. And so that, that just wasn't going to fly. And then the way they figured it out is they basically, and again, this guy's a particle physicist. He, has, he knows nothing about building wind farms or, or setting up electrical grids. He knew that there were companies out there that had that expertise, and he basically asked for bids from multinational companies to build these uh, wind farms in Uruguay and said, you guys pay for the building of the, um, of the wind farms, and we, Uruguay, we will guarantee that we will buy 100% of the energy that you produce. And we can set the rate and it will, you will have a, that set rate for the next 25 years. And so they did that. And they were able to attract enough companies to build out their wind infrastructure. And they now have, through a combination of wind, solar, biomass, and hydroelectric, they have 98% of the grid being powered by renewable energy, uh, which is quite a feat. They no longer have blackouts. They have plenty of power now, and they no longer depend on the commodity prices of natural gas or oil or coal, all of which they would have to import um, in order to, to sustain their economy and their standard of living. And so it shows that with the right um, amount of political will, and the right kind of energy um, behind, of the people behind it, that something like this can happen, even in a very, you know, relatively poor country like Uruguay. Uruguay did not have the money to do it, but they had a, they figured out a way of doing it. Now, the downside is the prices of renewable energy have been going down, yet they are locked into the prices that they set about 12 years ago when they went into this. Um, but the other... Um, their other option was building coal plants or nuclear plants. And they looked, they, they, at first, Ramon, being a particle physicist, looked into nuclear. And he thought that that was the way to go. But he realized they would have to import uh, uranium. And then building that infrastructure was even more expensive. And they would always have to figure out disposal and, and importation of fuel. Uh, this one, they just had to set it up. And it was a resource that they had. And they would never have to import anything from another country again. Um, to fuel their um, energy needs. All right. Well, I thought it was a very interesting article. Again, if you want to look into it, it is called. This article is called uh, "What Does Sustainable Living Look Like?" Maybe like your way from New York Times Magazine. Also, NPR um, on Planet Money had a, a podcast about it, um, where they interviewed Ramon Mendez Galen, and uh, that was also very interesting. And did not know that Uruguay was such a well-developed and high standard of living country in South America, which, um, uh, and I guess if you're a soccer fan, their soccer team does way better than you would expect for the size of country that they are. So that was another interesting thing I found out. All right, well, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, leave me your comments below. Tell me what you guys think. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day.